Hi, today we're going to talk about how to write a method section. So I think a lot of people misunderstand how they're supposed to do this because I have a lot of students write a kind of mini paper thing for lab reports and method sections are where they just really do not understand what they're supposed to be doing. Now you might find that hard to believe because people say, oh, wait, but it's methods. You just write what you did, right? Well, yes, but it's important to understand that when we talk about how to convey what was done or what should be done, there are three different sorts of scientific documents we can have. So the first thing you can have is what we call a standard operating procedure or an SOP. And this is frequently what you get uh, when you go into a lab and someone gives you instructions on how to do things. Um, so let me show you a couple of different examples of SOPs that have been used at Evergreen. So here's the first one, and this is a standard operating procedure that one of my research students wrote for running field samples on the ICPMS. And so you can see that the first thing that you have to do is create internal standards. And if you look at how this is written, it's very, very, very specific. So we have bullet point one, create internal standards, and there's very specific instructions on how you do that, down to how do you label the Falcon 2. Here is another procedure Again, this is from a lab. This is from one of the labs that I do with my general chemistry students where we're doing titrations of citrus juices. So if you look at this, and by the way, if you want to see this SOP, um, go on to Canvas because I have this posted there. So if it's too hard to read, if you're doing this on your phone or something, you can get the actual document there and you can zoom that in or out as you need to. So you can see here again this is very 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 specific. Um, you know here's how to create the NaOH solution right and you can see it tells you exactly what glassware to use, um, how much NaOH to add, and then what you do etc cetera, etc cetera. and this goes on. We're going to come back to this later so I'm not going to go into too much detail. The whole idea behind a standard operating procedure is that you want to make your thing idiot proof. I mean don't take that too personally because of course I just said that I use these for students but a lot of times especially when you're talking about you know first year students they really don't have any idea what they're doing in lab and so you have to spell everything out step by step. Another reason why you'd want to use an SOP is if it's something that you do over and over and over again to the point where you don't stop to think about it. And sometimes if you're having a bad day and you're not really thinking about what you're doing, um, you can, you know, just forget something. So that, that happens. So that's why we use SOPs. Something you're going to see a lot of if you do environmental work is what we call a standard method. So let's take a look at our standard method. So this particular standard method is the EPA method 160.1, which is for total dissolved solids. So this is a procedure that someone who does freshwater work does over and over again. So you can see if we scroll through, it starts off with um, very general information. So it tells you um, what sort of water you can use it for. There's a summary of what you're doing. Okay, now I'm going to kind of skip ahead. So here's the procedure. If you look at the procedure, you see that it's relatively detailed um, and could possibly be used as an SOP. However, let's scroll back. Okay, so this is section seven. Section six is the equipment that you use. So it's basically designed to get you to pull all your stuff together before you start. Now let's look at section five. Section five says interferences. Interferences tells you how this method might change under certain conditions. In other words, if you have any of these 
conditions, then you might need to change the standard procedure that's in Section 7. So you can see by looking at Section 5 how you could easily amend Section 7 if, for example, you have waters containing significant concentrations of calcium or magnesium or chloride. And, you know, especially for us because we actually tried doing a TDS on seawater, which has a lot of chloride and sulfate, um, that it is hard to get a good TDS measurement. It will require prolonged drying. So these are all the things we sort of talked about when we were talking about salinity back in winter quarter. All right, so that's a standard method. You'll also be seeing more of those later when we do our exercises. All right, now the third way that we provide experimental instructions to people is with a method section in a paper. Now method sections are very different from SOPs and standard methods. And if I had to give a quick summary about how they were different, I think I would just say they are a lot more brief. So basically you're going to give the minimum information necessary so whoever's reading it can replicate your work. Now, in order to do that, we make some assumptions, right? Anytime you write, you think about your audience, and we are going to assume as we give minimum information that your readers are going to have at least some scientific training. And so keep that in mind as you look at method sections. In general, if you look at a method section and you look at the style, you're going to notice that it's pretty much always written in past tense. There's a reason for that which is that by the time you get around to writing it up, you've already finished it, and hopefully you will not have to do it again, right? So it's done. It's written in past tense. And then there's a question of how to write it. So a lot of people say you should write in passive voice. There is a way to write in active voice. It's a lot harder, and for rookies, I think it's a lot easier to write in passive voice. So you could try it either way. I'll give you some examples later on. Now I'm going to quickly give you some ideas to keep in mind as you try and figure out what to put in your method section and what not to put in your method section. First of all, because of the nature of this class, there's a good chance we're going to be talking about things that involve collecting samples in the field. And so it's really important that your method section contains something about how the samples were collected. Something I see a lot in rookie attempts at method sections is that people are very, very, very specific about how they used instrumentation. So in general, the rule of thumb is, yes, you should tell the readers what instrumentation you used, but you don't have to go into gory detail. And so I want you to think about this and I want you to reframe it as I'm going to keep asking you to do over and over again in terms of what would it take for your reader to replicate this. And so when it comes to instrumentation, let's just say that we're doing microscope work. The question is, if they had to do the same microscope work as you, would they have to use the exact same brand of microscope? And the answer is no. Like, let's say there's just two different brands of dissecting microscopes. So, cool. You can, you can look at a sample under either of those. Now, the reason we don't talk about how we use the instrumentation, usually, is that every microscope is going to be subtly different. Every instrument from different manufacturers is going to be subtly different from, you know, other manufacturers' instruments. And so, we sort of expect that a well-trained scientist can read a user manual, right? So if you just say, we use this sort of microscope, and then they can say, oh, well, that brand of microscope is a dissecting microscope, so as long as I use the dissecting microscope, I should be able to see exactly what they saw.
Now, unless you're crazy like me, you will not be making up your own methods. I mean, method development's a great challenge and that's probably why I do so much of it, but it's also really hard and annoying. So a lot of times you're gonna be using methods that other people have used before and if you do that, you can compress the amount that you put in your paper, because remember, we're trying to make it minimal, by referring to whoever you got the method from, right? So, depending on who you talk to, some people will just say, you know, following the method of, you know, Vasquez et al. I personally, so this is personal, but I personally, if it's kind of a complicated method, I usually give a quick summary where I say, you know, following the method of Cooper et al. And then I say briefly, comma, and I give a two sentence summary. So there's a reason I do that, which is that I have seen papers and if you talk to people who have done methods work before, a lot of times they'll say, well, I, I saw this cited in one paper and they cited this other paper and I went back to that paper and I, they cited another paper and I kept going and I couldn't find the actual method. Okay, so this is why I do the briefly, so at least people have a clue as to how it starts. So if you're using a method, but you're also tweaking it just a bit, like if you're saying, hey, I'm trying to improve this method, then you can say, we're following the procedures of Vasquez et al, except we are substituting, you know, this chemical for that chemical. Okay, so make sure that you explain how you've made it different. All right, so with that, let's take a look at a few methods papers. So Here's an example of a method section, which is not called a method section, it's called Experimental Procedures. And so this is an environmental microbiology paper, 2012, uh, Rowe and Barbeau. And let's look at what they put in here. I mentioned that you have to explain where you got your sample from. And the samples that they're using here is they're using trichodesmium and some bacteria associated with trichodesmium. And so you can see they tell where they got the microbial strains from. So that's how you got your strains, but also they talk about how they grow it under what conditions, right? So um, here we have the iron limited trichodesmium growth conditions. And so they talk about their growth medium. How did they make it? Well, 75% offshore Pacific seawater, where they collected the seawater, 400 miles off the coast of California, 25% millicu water, so that's basically super pure DI water, which is filter and microwave sterilized, and they talk about how they sterilized it. Um, and then they talk about what else they added to that to make it suitable for growth. And you can see they don't add the sorts of details that we think about having in a standard operating procedure. So when they're making this, how much do they make? So you can look through that. And by the way, this paper is posted on Canvas if you wanna look a little more carefully. Well, it doesn't say, did they make one liter? Did they make two liters? Did they make five liters? Well, that depends. Does it matter how much they made? And see, that's the question you always have to ask yourself. Does it matter? When you put any details in there, you have to say, does it matter? If, if Kelly Rowe made five liters of this R medium, and I was trying to replicate this experiment, and I made two liters of medium, would it matter? No, right? You only need to make however much you need to make to grow the amount of bacteria that you were planning to grow, or in this case, the trichodesmium. So they're not gonna give specifics, like how many grams did I weigh out? If you look at the method section, what it tells you is the molarity, right? So 
you could scale this if you were doing tons and tons and tons of incubations you could be making 20 liters of culture medium at a time or you could be making 500 mils and just knowing the final concentration you could scale that up or down depending on how much you need it right how much you make is not an important detail and so we leave it out probably the best story I have to tell about this is that when I started growing bacteria my fourth year in grad school I asked my collaborator what she used for an artificial seawater recipe and she said oh it's in this paper by Van Westbergen 1993 Journal of Bacteriology so I pulled it out materials and methods and I scanned through I was looking for where it could be and it says media and culture conditions I said that sounds like a great place and I looked through for an artificial seawater recipe and I didn't see anything that looked like a recipe but here it is uh, I'll highlight the part down below but it continues up above and it says the medium is a modified cane medium containing you know this many milligrams of peptone per mil, 0.5 milligrams of yeast extract per mil in artificial seawater. And here's the artificial seawater recipe. Parentheses, 0.3 molar NaCl, 0.05 molar MgSO4, 0.01 molar CaCl2, 0.01 molar KCl. That's it. Close parentheses, right? So it's just basically one line, a little more than one line. In a parenthetical aside, this is how you make your artificial seawater. Right, so you are trying to make this as extremely terse as possible while also conveying the information. That is the goal when you write a method section. I'm going to show you one more method section just so you can get an idea of how we do instrumentation in a method section. So this is Lynch et al. from the journal Geophysical Research Planets 2015 and you can see that the methods start with field sampling so again we're going to how you collected your samples and where and you could see um, it even talks about the seasons, which is really important in many places. So, but now I'm going to go down to three point, sections 3.2, 3.3, and 3.4, because this is where we talk about the instrumental analysis. Okay, section 3.2 talks about qualitative x-ray diffraction. So you can see here it tells which XRD machine that we used. Sorry, this I say we because this was a, a paper that I helped on. I ran the XRD analysis for this. Okay. Um, and they talk about the parameters. So a lot of times when you're doing instrumental analysis, sometimes there will be settings that you can pick on the instrument so you know oh, I'm gonna look at this range of things so that's that's a parameter that you should probably put in your paper and so you could see the parameters they we picked in terms of the, the two theta range which I know makes no sense to you if you don't know about XRD and now I'm gonna go down to 3.4 gonna skip the, the quem scan stuff okay standard geochemical analysis IC and ICP OES Okay, so we're talking about how we characterize basically the, gra the groundwater. Okay, major an anions were measured using a Dionics ICS-90 ion chromatography system running an AS14A 4 times 250 millimeter column. So when you're running this particular instrument, the IC, the ions you can detect depends on which column you put in. So we said we did ion analysis we told which column we used. And again, now you look at the ICP OES, the inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometer. It tells which one we used, the Perkin Elmer Optima 5300 dB. Um, 
How did we get those sediment samples ready for IC and ICP analysis? We followed a standard method, following the Florida Department of Environmental Protection method NU044-3.12. Okay. And then how did we prepare our samples? Filtered and prepared as stated in the section 3.1, that's the, the field sampling thing. And then all ICP samples were acidified with trace metal grade nitric acid. Now, does that matter? So there's a detail. There's something where we're not being generic. We're being very specific. We're not just talking about nitric acid. We're talking about trace metal grade nitric acid. Well, what are we doing this for? Major cations were measured. Okay, what, what does that mean? It means basically your metals, right? Most cations are metals. So if you're doing a trace metal grade, you don't have random metal contamination. So you can see that where we put those really finicky details, it's because if you used something else, you might be contaminated or it would make a substantial difference in the outcome of your results. Now, what I want to do is I want to go back to this standard operating procedure that I showed you earlier. And I want to take this and turn it into how I would write up a method section version of this standard operating procedure. Okay, and this is what your assignment is going to be not with this particular SOP, but I'm going to have you work on some other SOPs uh, as your assignment for Wednesday. So if we look at this procedure, let's start with the first thing. It says important notes on precision. Be sure to read your burette to two decimal places underlined. Always use an analytical balance that measures to a tenth of a milligram to weigh your KHP. Doing both of these things will allow you to get four significant figures in your calculation of the NaOH molarity. Now, the reason I put this in the SOP is because a lot of times people who are just starting in chemistry don't know how many decimal places to read a burette to. And then they don't get very good precision. Well, one hopes that by the time a reader gets around to diving into the scientific literature, they know something about significant figures, right? Significant figures are a measure of how precisely you could measure everything. And so, what we're trying to do here is just get people to use proper technique. But we don't put that in a method section because we just assume that people are using proper technique. You always write as if people were using proper technique. Create 1.0 liters of an approximately 0.2 molar NaOH solution. Okay, and now let's look. Fill a one liter volumetric flask about two thirds full with DI water. add this many. Do we need to use one liter? If someone were doing this later, could they make two liters? Yes. Could they make five liters? Yes. And any time you change the volume, you're going to use different amounts of NaOH. So we're not going to put that in. Swirl until completely dissolved and dilute to the line with DI water. Okay, look, people who write scientific papers, I hope, know how to use a volumetric flask. So we're not going to put that information in. Okay, transfer your solution to a plastic bottle and label it co correctly. Now, you know, we hope that people can label bottles. That's pretty standard. So what have we taken out of this whole major point one? Well, we're making a 0.2 molar NaOH solution. And for the most part, Anyone with a reasonable chemistry background, if you said make a 0.2 molar NaOH solution, they could sit down and figure out how to do that. So all you have to tell them is that it's a 0.2 molar NaOH solution. So now I'm starting this document in which I'm keeping track of the things I want to put in this method section, the bare minimum. We'll come back and we'll, we'll just do this as we go and then we'll come back and look at it overall. Okay, number two. Standardize the NaOH solution using KHP. Okay, and so now here are details. 
weigh out three samples, transfer each, add enough, add DI water and two drops of phenolphthalein, titrate with the NaOH, record the amount of NaOH that was used to reach this endpoint, and repeat for the other two flasks. Okay, and I'm just going to add point three. Um, calculate the molarity. Ideally, you will get three values for your molarity that are within 5% of each other. If not, do additional titrations of KHP until you can get three values within 5%. Now, first of all, the number of replicates <laughs> that you can keep doing it until you're assured of your precision, like that's just part of being an analytical chemist. So we don't have to put that in there. Okay. Standardize the NaOH solution using KHP. So I've added that phrase that the NaOH solution was standardized using potassium hydrogen phthalate. So you can never use abbreviations until you've spelled it out and put parentheses what that abbreviate what the abbreviation for that full name is. So that's what I've done here. Um, now, you could say, well, Robin, what, what about standard, well, standardization is actually something that is a standard analytical technique, so we don't have to go into details. So step four and all its subparts are determining which citrus juice contains the highest percentage of acid, right? And so if you look at this, step A, weigh an Erlenmeyer flask, add five mils of the juice to the flask, and weigh again. What are we doing there? Weighing by difference. That's like day one of Genicamp lab. And we don't need to put that in there. Dilute the juice. Does it matter how much water we add to dilute the juice? No, not really. Um, add two drops of phenolphthalein. Yeah, that might be important. Knowing what you use as your indicator might be important. Um, so let's highlight that. Titrate with NaOH. Now at this point, my students have done enough titrations because they did the KHP standardization and everything that I don't tell them how to titrate. By the time my students get through GenCam, they've done a lot of titrations and I imagine that you all probably did as well, right? So a lot of these titrations, we don't say, you know, fill the burette or tell you what size of burette to use. We just say titrate, okay? And then confidence in your results. That's just standard. Titrate the fruit juices with NaOH using phenolphthalein as an indicator, right? Okay, so I took basically two pages of writing and I condensed it down to two sentences. Now, having done that, I'm going to edit it down further. And here's how I'm going to do it. Okay, so I'm going to go through every tidbit of this and ask myself, is this a necessary detail? Make a 0.2 molar NaOH solution. Okay, question. Does the NaOH solution have to be 0.2 molar? Would it work if you had a 0.1 molar NaOH solution? Yes, you would use twice as much, which might not be ideal, um, but it would work. Would it work if you made a 0.4 molar NaOH solution? Yes. I mean, you would use half as much when you're titrating, but you could still titrate with a 0.4 molar NaOH solution. So does it matter that we used a 0.2 molar NaOH solution? No. Okay. Okay. So we're just going to cross that part out. We're going to now say, and we standardized using potassium hydrogen phthalate. Standardization is a way of figuring out exactly what molarity um, your solution is. So the question is, do you have to use potassium hydrogen phthalate? Well, uh, you could probably use something else. That's pretty standard, actually, as a base standard. I'm not sure if I would put that in or not. The other thing, I, you'll notice that I've written this. This is all written in kind of the imperative tense in that I'm ordering you what to do. This is what you have to do. Like, that's what I do when I'm teaching lab, right? I stand around and I'm like, crack the whip. This is what you gotta do. This is what you gotta do. Um, 
But remember, we're supposed to write this in the past tense. Okay, so. So here's something that I wrote that's in past tense. And you'll notice that this is written in what we call the passive voice. NaOH solution was standardized using potassium hydrogen phthalate. Samples of fruit juice were titrated using standardized NaOH solution with phenylphthalein as an indicator. I think there's a little bit of redundancy there. I could probably get it down to be even more concise, but I'm just doing a very quick, um, quick indicator. Okay, now I'm gonna rewrite it again. This time I'm gonna use an active voice. Okay, so here's my shot at doing an active voice, past tense, um, method section. Titration with NaOH solution, standardized with KHP, using phenylphthalein as an indicator, determine the acid levels of fruit juice samples. I don't really like that too much. I could probably rewrite it to be better. But again, I just put that together in like one minute, so I didn't spend too much time trying. But you can see, in both cases, those are fairly concise. They still convey the important information that people could use to completely replicate your results. And that is basically what you want to do. So your assignment is to go on Canvas look for the assignment that's called condensing SOPs into a method section. And basically what I have there is I have three SOPs. One of them is the graphometric determination of chloride. The other two will look very familiar to you. There's a alkalinity titration and there's also the color metric determination of silica. So imagine that you're putting those in the method section of a paper and write a blurb for a method section. That's your job. We are going to be discussing your blurbs in small groups on Wednesday, so make sure you have something put together. One thing that I will also post on Canvas, or two things, is I'm gonna post the standard methods for both of those. And I think it would be really interesting for you to go through and look. We're actually going to talk about the standard methods, but I'm going to post the standard methods, the USGS alkalinity, and then the, I forget, is it the ASTM? I forget who put together the color metric determination of silica thing, um, but I have the standard method for that as well. And so those will be on Canvas too. So if you have a chance, look at those. If not, don't worry about it because we are going to talk about those on Wednesday. So I just want you to give it a shot. It doesn't have to be perfect because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be comparing these to what your peers have written and talking about why you wrote them differently. So it's always interesting to see what some people think is important and some, what some people think is not. And so that's always a good discussion to have. I will see you soon.